I am uh, Jeremy. I'm the chef and owner of Brasica Kitchen in Jamaica Plain. I've been cooking since I was 13, professionally since I was 18. Um, I was like a, tro I got in no trouble and, and uh, kind of found my home in the kitchen at 18. I worked for free for Barbara Lynch at Number no. 9 Park back when that was kind of the creme de la creme of kitchens. Um, and then took an apprenticeship from there with a French chef named uh, Kevin Kilbasa. And uh, I, I worked with him for six years as his apprentice and then Rialto for Jody Adams. And then I, uh, I broke off to the West Coast to, to get into like growing food and growing pot and, uh, and, and cooking in that, in that cooking out of a garden with open fire and, and stuff like what that. Kind of it food? changed the way I thought about food, yeah, yeah. Out of necessity for what we had to cook with, the lack of equipment, and um, being able to grow all our food. I find that we, I, I can't put a cuisine that we draw, we call ourselves French, but that's so we don't have to explain ourselves too deeply. Um, but I think we're, we're really into learning here, and so we like to understand a tradition with enough depth that we can question it. Hey everyone, I'm Benjamin Siegel, and welcome to Taste, Culture, and Power. In 20 videos, I'm going to give you a big picture outline of the history of food from prehistory to the present day, and we're going to consider examples from all around the world. We're going to cover so much ground. Beginning with the science of food and taste, we're going to consider the origins of agriculture and the role of food in antiquity and religious life. We're going to explore the spread of crops and food practices around the early modern world, and we're going to investigate the uncomfortable and troubling relationship between food, sugar, and the global slave trade. We're going to think about hunger, intoxication, and stimulation, and the origins of industrial food, before considering the birth of national cuisines, and the way in which imperialism changed eating practices of people around the world. Then we're going to look at the food that immigrants brought with them to the United States, while probing the linkages between race and modern eating practices. We're going to look at the birth of nutrition as a way of thinking about food, and the scandals of food adulteration that helped change how we eat today. Things are going to get really interesting as we get to the 20th century, when we think about the relationship between food, famines, and war, and the new technologies that helped many people believe that the world was finally ridding itself from the scourge of hunger. We're going to unpack some of the problems in our food system today, and there's a lot of them. From the rise of fast food and new concerns over ethics and food justice, to questions of technology and politics in our food systems. And finally, we're going to think about the future. How are we going to eat over the next several decades of the 21st century and beyond, as the tastes of the rich and middle classes grow ever more cosmopolitan, but our planet grows more and more hot and crowded? What are our meals going to look like 200 years from now, and how should they look? I thought long and hard about where to begin this story, and I realized the best thing that we could do would be to actually start with some of the things that we can eat, and some of the reasons why we eat them. I want you to picture all of the things you just ate in the last 24 hours. The range of foods you put into your body. That's probably a really big range, but I bet it's even wider than just the story of whatever meals you had. Let's think a little bit about this. The range of what human beings can eat is just incredible. We're primates, and like most primates, we're omnivores. But humans have the widest range of available foods of any animal. We can eat things that are raw and cooked, things that are nearly every temperature and texture, things that you've taken directly from a plant or an animal, or things that you've put aside and deliberately aged for years and years and years. We're definitely adaptive creatures. We've learned to adapt to different foods over tens of thousands of years, but we can also learn to adapt to a new food in a matter of months. Think about all the things that you might enjoy that are kind of acquired tastes. Remember the first time you had a piece of aged cheese, or a glass of beer if you're of legal drinking age in whatever country you happen to be in, or the first time you had a really spicy chili? Maybe something like a pickle, or a kimchi, or a piece of cured meat? You might not like all or any of those things, but many human beings learn to really love them and cultivate a taste for them. Foods also get used by us. They adapt themselves to our tastes through processes of symbiotic evolution. 
They get sweeter, bigger, more potent, by themselves and with our help. So let's try to give some order to our diets. We basically only eat four different types of ingredients, and we eat things from only some of the six kingdoms on Earth. Mostly we eat plants and animals, though humans also eat fungi and some eubacteria, things like spirulina if you've ever had that in a smoothie. When we put it that way, it might seem like our food choices are kind of limited. But everything we do with these ingredients is the work of culture. We take substances and we turn them into other forms of substances through different processes. We turn raw materials into food and we turn sustenance into art. I was never really a great student of chemistry, but we're going to have to do just a little bit of chemistry today as we go through the four big chemical protagonists here. Those are water, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins, the raw materials that make up the story of food. I don't have a scientific mind, I have a creative mind. Um, so, you know, it's been about forcing the understanding of what's happening sci from science in order to achieve the creativity. So a lot of the time I have no fucking idea what's going on. I just works or it doesn't. Yeah, and there's usually someone here that we're collaborating with on staff that does understand that and can kind of explain it to me. Let's start out with water. It's this substance you encounter in a relatively straightforward way several times a day. It's one of the simplest molecules out there and it's perhaps the simplest thing that we ingest. It's just two hydrogen atoms and then an oxygen atom linked pretty loosely together. But water isn't just something that we take directly. All life in the known universe lives in a suspension of water. We're around 60% water by weight, and the fruits and vegetables that we eat are close to 95%. And here's your basic chemistry reminder. Water's chemical quality means that it clings most closely to itself. But its hydrogen bond is pretty weak, and so it gets formed and broken and reformed all the time. Without getting too into the specifics here, this is the reason that carbohydrates and fat can dissolve in water. And it's the reason that water changes form relatively quickly, moving from ice to liquid and then to gas. And here's your slightly more advanced chemistry lesson. If you go inside water, there is a lot of randomly floating hydrogen molecules inside. In any given quantity of water, that's around two ten millionths of a single percent of those hydrogen molecules. Why do you care? So those molecules end up destabilizing the protons, or units of positive charge, in the water. I know this is way too much chemistry. But what you should probably know is that it means that the water's properties will make a substance either an acid or a base. An acid is a chemical compound that releases protons into solutions, and a base is the complementary group of chemicals that accepts protons and neutralizes them. As cooks and as eaters, acids and bases are exceptionally important for us. Mostly we eat and enjoy acids. The majority of what we eat is slightly acidic. Think about things that we enjoy like coffee or steak. And acidity also helps us regulate some of the other qualities of foods, particularly when they're being cooked. The degree of acidity in a given cooking medium determines whether fruits or vegetables stay bright or they turn brown, or whether meats or eggs turn soft or tough. We'll come back to that in just a sec. Let's talk about lipids. Lipids are fats and oils, and like water, they're both found in living things and can also be used on their own as a cooking medium. Lipids and oils have very, very different chemical qualities from water. In any given lipid, you have carbon and hydrogen atoms that are pulled tightly together, in contrast with the very weak bonds of water. You know the most basic thing about oil and water. Without help, they don't mix. Living things make use of that incompatibility. They use fatty materials to contain the watery content of cells, making substances that we call membranes. Living beings also use fats and oils as storage. Look inside any animal or human body, as humans are animals, and you've got deposits of fat. That fat serves as a concentrated form of chemical energy, with twice the energetic density of either sugar or starch. We might have complicated relationships with the fat that we store in our bodies, but we, like all living beings, need fat for our long-term storage. Another property of fats and oils that you probably know is that they're often delicious. We use fats all the time in the kitchen. They carry smells and tastes, and they produce them by themselves. They help give a smooth texture to most foods. They also change the structure and quality of the foods we eat. We talk about tenderizing food, and that's done when fats permeate and weaken a food's structure. 
We can also use fats to heat foods well beyond the boiling point of water, or to dry out food surfaces to give a crisp texture. Think for a second about a perfect french fry. Its surface is crisp, but inside it's really smooth and creamy. And that's the complex interaction of a starch that's been retextured by heated fat. But beyond crisping or browning a food, you can also use a fat to thicken a sauce with fat droplets that you whip into it in tiny but intact particles. Fats also differ from water in that they don't have defined melting points. Instead of transforming suddenly, like water, fats generally soften over a big temperature range. And as their temperature rises, the whole structure of a fat changes qualities. It's that slow, changing quality that lets us use fat to make cakes or pastries. And we enjoy it when we take a stick of butter out of the refrigerator and we let it soften a little bit with the changing temperature. Eventually, a fat will turn into a gas, but only at a really high temperature. But most fats will decompose at temperatures below their boiling point. And if fat particles come into contact with a flame, they sometimes spontaneously ignite. And you've probably seen that if you've seen a chef working over a skillet or a wok, or maybe you've even done it yourself in the kitchen. All of those qualities mean that fats have maximum useful temperatures, a point at which they're really not that useful to us. The temperature at which a fat breaks down into gas is known as the smoke point. Reaching that point usually ruins the food that's being cooked in it or in that medium. The temperature at which a fat breaks down into gas is known as the smoke point, and reaching that point usually means that the food is ruined. There's also one more quality of fats that we make use of a lot in the kitchen. Certain fats can be used as emulsifiers to make really fine, creamy mixtures of fat and water. Again, fat and water don't usually mix with one another, but emulsifiers can do that. They can produce sauces like mayonnaise and hollandaise, which are gonna play a pretty important role in our story later on. Let's take a look at some of my favorite things in the world of food. Carbohydrates, which are basically starches and sugars. You don't need to be a chemist to look at that name and to know that they're a large group of molecules made up of carbon and water. All plants and animals produce carbohydrates to store chemical energy. But plants also use carbohydrates as a building structure, making a supporting skeleton for other cells. In plants, you have lots of different carbohydrates working together. Simple sugars and starches are used as energy storage, while pectin, cellulose, and other cell wall carbohydrates serve as structural materials for a plant. You already know the simplest carbohydrates, which are just sugars. There's of course not one type of sugar, but many different ones, and they're just distinguished from each other by the number of carbon atoms they contain and the different arrangement or shape that they assume. We're gonna talk a ton later on about sugars and their role in the modern world. But sugars with five carbons are particularly important in producing and reproducing life. Ribose and deoxyribose are both five carbon sugars, and they're the backbone of ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid, which of course carry our genetic material. But in terms of the sugars that we consume directly, we should focus on glucose with its six carbon molecules. Glucose is the molecule that most living things get most of their energy from. It's the fuel for the biochemical machinery of all animal cells. Sugars like glucose are so important to us that we have a special sense to detect them. Some of us describe ourselves as having something of a sweet tooth. I'm actually not one of them. But sugars do offer a pretty universal source of pleasure for most humans and many other animals. That biological role has taken on cultural forms. We serve sweets at the end of meals, and candies, and confections, and we used to think of sugar as a medicine. Over time, interacting with plants, we work to produce a lot more sugar in many of the foods that we consume. There's other forms of sugars we should think about that we call oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. Polysaccharides include things like starch and cellulose, and it's starch that's the most important polysaccharide for most of us as cooks and eaters. Starch is a compact and pretty unreactive polymer that plants use to store their supplies of sugar. If you take starch and you put it under a microscope, you'll see a series of concentric layers that build up, and they form solid, tiny granules. And when you take some of that starchy plant tissue, like a grain of rice, and you cook it in water, those granules absorb water, they swell, and they release starch molecules. So starch isn't just tasty, but it's also really versatile. It's that quality of expanding and rebounding that determines the texture of cooked rice, noodles, breads, pastries, many different sauces. 
If you speak Taiwanese Chinese, for example, there's a word for that starchiness. It's described as Q. It's kind of an ideal sponginess that's perfect for something like a good noodle or a tapioca pearl in boba tea. In Italian, you could think of that same texture as al dente. Now let's have a look at proteins. To some degree, proteins are the most challenging form of food molecules for us to understand. All of the other food molecules, water, fats, carbohydrates, are pretty stable. But if you add heat, acid, salt, or air to protein, its behavior begins to change drastically. That quality reflects the biological mission of proteins, or what they're designed to do. The carbohydrates and fats that we've talked about are more or less passive forms of stored energy. They're structural or storage materials. But proteins are meant to move and to do things. They're the active machinery of all life. Basically, proteins have a job to do. They assemble all of the molecules that make a cell, and they tear them down as well, and they move molecules from one place to another in any given cell. In the form of muscle cells, they move entire animals and organisms themselves. We might try to build up our muscle cells through sports and diet, where we're building up certain forms of stored protein in the body. But as cooks, we also know how to take advantage of proteins and their dynamic nature. We can make new structures and change protein consistency through different forms of cooking. Proteins, like starch and cellulose, are large polymers of smaller molecular units, which we call amino acids. There's around 20 different types of amino acids that occur in significant quantities in our food. But for our purposes, thinking about human food, amino acids and peptides do three major things. First, when you cook something at a high temperature, you take food and you brown it. Browning is that quality of certain amino acids as they're being transformed by heat, and most cooks are really interested in mastering that transformation. There's a particular term for that transformation which cooks and chemists call Mallard reactions. Of course, there's browning that doesn't take place on proteins but on sugars, and we call that caramelization, where sugars are given fragrant, volatile molecules and brown-colored polymers. But browning proteins, or amino acids, gives you a really intense and full flavor. We use browning to produce bread and its crust, full-body chocolate, rich coffee, dark beers, and juicy roasted meat. Secondly, many amino acids and short peptides have tastes of their own. In a lot of foods, the partial breakdown of those amino acids gives you a really rich, deep taste. Think about things like aged cheese or a cured ham or soy sauce. The majority of amino acids are either sweet or bitter. But there's one particular type of peptide, glutamic acid, which is better known by its commercially concentrated name, or monosodium glutamate. Glutamic acid and other glutamates have a unique taste. In English, we sometimes call it savory or brothy. But increasingly, we've come to borrow a specific Japanese term for that flavor, umami. There's many artificial sources of umami. Cheetos or commercial ramen broths. But we also find them naturally in tomatoes, certain seaweeds, many salt-cured or fermented products. Japanese and German scientists learned to synthesize MSG around the turn of the last century. But well before that point, humans have already learned how to harness those unique, rich, naturally occurring flavors. Finally, the wide variety of chemical natures of amino acids influence the structure and behavior of the protein that they're a part of. Because different amino acids form bonds with fats, water, and other proteins, a single protein can have a large variety of chemical environments along its chain. There's parts that maybe attract water or repel water, and parts that form strong bonds with other proteins or even different parts of the same protein. So the different shapes of proteins and the bonds that they create help determine certain physical properties of foods. Some proteins, because of the strength of the bonds between molecules, are soluble in water, but some aren't. All of that is contingent on whether or not water is able to separate those molecules through hydrogen bonding. And this solubility helps determine how proteins function in terms of texture. Since I'm doing a little too much chemistry, let me try to make this a little more concrete. When you mix flour with water, you release gluten, which is a form of wheat protein. That absorbs a lot of water, but it doesn't dissolve. And so you get a certain sponginess, and that's the sponginess that gives bread its texture. The proteins that are found in muscles are held together really well by ionic bonds, so they don't fall apart in water, though many of the proteins in milk and eggs are water-soluble. As cooks, we can take advantage of proteins' textures through a process we call denaturing. 
If you apply a good amount of heat or acid to protein, you denature it, and you change its thickness or its density. If you denature eggs, you can get a fried egg or custard, depending on how you do it. If you denature fish protein slowly, you get a really perfectly flaky piece. But if you go too far or too fast, you denature proteins too tightly, and they don't spring back. The water gets pushed out and proteins get too dense or hard or dry. Think about a really bad plate of scrambled eggs or a piece of meat that's been cooked too long, like a really, really well done steak. I'll also mention a final group of proteins that are important for us as cooks and eaters. They don't contribute directly to food texture or consistency, but they change other qualities of the foods to which they're added. You might already know what I'm talking about. These proteins are enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. They increase the rate of specific chemical reactions that wouldn't otherwise happen or would happen really slowly. Some enzymes aren't very useful or are undesirable for us as cooks, but some are essential. Lots of the enzymes that we don't want are the enzymes that already exist in a given plant or animal and which did important work while it was alive. But after the death of a plant or animal, those enzymes harm an organism by changing its color, its texture, or its taste. Enzymes can take chlorophyll, which is usually bright green, and turn it gray or brown. Think about a vegetable or fruit going bad. They can also make fish flesh turn mushy. When bacterial enzymes break down foods too quickly, food rots or spoils. And we work hard to avoid this by storing food at low temperatures. But we also make productive use of enzymes. We tenderize meat by releasing its own enzymes, or we firm up vegetables in cold water before we cook them. We can also take food and ferment it to preserve it for longer, turning cabbage into sauerkraut or kimchi, for example. Okay, we make um, lacto-fermented hot sauce, and we take all these different peppers, and we take all the wine that's been opened that wouldn't otherwise get drank, and we mix that with water and salt, and we ferment peppers in there. And then once the peppers are fermented, we puree them with, you know, the garlic that's sitting in with the peppers and some maple syrup, and it makes this, like, killer hot sauce. But we then found that we had all this extra brine, but we're not gonna throw that away as we, we don't waste food here. So then what are we gonna do with that brine? Now we're using it like we would use wine to cook with. So we're opening mussels with it. We're marinating things. We're using it to start new ferments. And then after a while, we found that we needed that brine from those peppers more than we needed the peppers. So we started having to make this product with this much peppers and this much brine just to keep up with what we had achieved from, from having to figure out how to not throw that away. Now that we've talked about the building blocks of food, let's get to the good stuff, the food itself. And we're going to start at the most basic level with plants. Plants are the, at the core of all life on Earth. The plant world sustains all animals, and it's incredibly wide in its diversity. Think about all the plants you eat. You've got earthy roots, bright tasting or bitter or light tasting leaves, sweet fruits, nutty, rich seeds. Plants give us every taste, from sweetness to tartness to astringency and pain. And even if you're someone who says that they don't like vegetables, you still eat an incredible number of plants. Plants are diverse, and they're diverse because they had to be that way. Plants can't move around the way that animals do. So to survive, their chemical processes have adapted in incredible ways. Plants take air, light, water, and minerals, and they turn them into food. They feed themselves, and then they feed us. And plants use their colors, their tastes, and smells to deter enemies and to attract friends. And the substances that they use to protect themselves often protect us if we ingest them. Human beings have always been plant eaters. For at least a million years, early hominoids foraged and lived on a wide variety of wild fruit, leaves, and seeds. But then, around 10,000 years ago, we domesticated a few grains, seeds, legumes, and tubers. We figured out how to grow them and store them in large quantities. And with new control over our food supply, it was possible to feed a lot of people from a really small amount of land. That's the beginning of human civilization in a meaningful way with the advent of food surpluses, and we're going to come back to that next time. But let's go back a little further than that. The reason why we have plants at all owes to something that happened around 3 billion years ago. That was the time when a bacterium evolved that was able to take the light of the sun and store it as carbohydrate molecules. 
We see the evidence of this development all around us in the color green. Chlorophyll is that molecule which captures sunlight and initiates the process of photosynthesis, which culminates in the creation of glucose, a simple sugar. That first bacteria gave us algae, and then all green land plants. And photosynthetic bacteria, since it released oxygen into the atmosphere, helped create the atmosphere in which and animals were able to evolve. Today's plants have strong flavors and really different qualities. Again, that's an evolutionary feature since plants can't move, and so they have to use their qualities to harness other natural elements or animals to help them, or to avoid becoming someone else's meal. Plants produce thousands of strong tasting and occasionally poisonous chemicals that discourage animals, bacteria, and fungi from eating them. This is basically chemical warfare. Think about the oil that makes mustard so pungent, or that burning sensation from chilies, or the way that onions induce tears in many people when you cut them. We have lots of plant alkaloids that are bitter as well. Things like caffeine in coffee, or the cyanide compounds in lima beans and fruit seeds. Other compounds can interfere with animal digestion, like the astringent tannins that you find in something like banana peels, which you don't eat. Plants are brilliant, but animals are also pretty smart. And over time, animals like humans have learned to use their senses of taste and smell to detect chemical compounds in really small concentrations, recognizing and avoiding harmful plants. We've got innate responses to certain tastes, like our aversion to the bitterness of alkaloids or cyanide. And as I mentioned before, we're also attracted to the sweetness of nutritionally important sugars. But these qualities aren't universal. Some animals have developed detoxifying enzymes to help them exploit plants that would be toxic to other creatures. We can't eat eucalyptus leaves, but koalas can. And milkweed is poisonous to us, but not to monarch butterfly caterpillars. But since humans have bred plants, we've been able to use time and reproduction to help us out. Cabbage, lima beans, potatoes, and lettuce all used to be toxic to us in their wild forms, but we cultivated varieties that over time we could actually eat. Now, just because something is toxic or produces a strange sensation doesn't mean that we won't eat or seek it out. We're actually pretty good at figuring out what's actually harmful to us and what's just going to give us a good thrill. Many of us love things like mustard or pepper, chili, onions. We can go further than this. Many human beings like things like cannabis, which alters the base functioning of the brain and nervous system. But let's stick with more mundane plants for now. The most prominent type of plants that we eat that aren't grains are fruits and vegetables. We define a vegetable as a plant material which is neither a fruit or a seed. And that's really not that helpful of a definition. So let's look at fruits instead. Botanists think of fruits as the organ that develops around a flower's ovary and surrounds the seeds of a plant. But actually, we mix this up a bit. Green beans, eggplants, cucumbers are all technically fruits, but we generally think of them as vegetables. The same, of course, with the tomato. It's really a fruit, but we use a cook's definition and tend to call it a vegetable. Sweetness, of course, is one of the big dividing lines here. Many things that we call fruits have a high sugar content and they satisfy or reach out to that desire of humans and other animals for sweetness. Just to call fruits sweet doesn't really actually do them justice. Smell a great piece of citrus, and you'll know there's a lot of different chemical compounds there at work. But broadly, we enjoy eating fruits because of their, these qualities. The word comes from the Latin word fructus, meaning gratification or enjoyment. Vegetables tend to be firmer. They've got milder flavors, maybe strong but non-sweet ones, and they more often require cooking or preparation to be desirable. I find that like eating a big plate of boiled bok choy with salt is just like with a little bit of rice. Or maybe some like really good soy sauce or really good like black Chinese black vinegar or something like that. It just feels so good afterwards. I mean, it's the thing I know the least about in terms of cooking. I think about like a, you think about like a guitar player that's really good and they are able to go on and blah, 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 and everyone kind of in shred and everyone kind of says, wow. But then 20 years later in their career, when they're a true master, maybe they only play one chord, but they play it so well. It's all about how it makes you feel instead of the, and uh, so we're starting to say, if you eat something, Maybe it's not about the first reaction of, oh my God, that tastes so good, but how does it, how do you feel once you're done eating it? Um, and to me, gaining more skill with vegetables is kind of the, the path to that concept. 
There are a few other things we should mention that are neither fruit nor vegetable. Herbs and spices are another form of plant, but their distinction is more straightforward. Herbs come from green parts of the plant, usually the leaves, and you can think of things like parsley, thyme, or basil. But spices are usually things like seeds, bark, or stems. Things like black pepper, cinnamon, or ginger. Finally, while they're part of plants, we usually think of seeds as something separate in a culinary sense, and they are. The category of seeds includes grains, and we're going to talk all about grains next time. But seeds, in a functional sense, are an embryonic plant, surrounded by a thick food supply that helps them germinate and grow. Almost all seeds have an outer layer. Think of the shell of a peanut or a pumpkin seed. That outer layer insulates an embryonic plant from the soil, and it protects it from attack from microbes or animals. Broadly speaking, we use three different types of seeds. Grains, as I mentioned, are also called cereals. They're broadly grasses, and the different kinds of plants that we make from them. Sometimes we eat them by themselves, like popcorn, or we make bread, noodles, and porridge from them. There's also legumes, plants in the bean family, generally found in pods, which includes one seed or a few seeds. And then there are nuts. Nuts come from a few different families. They're large seeds covered by hard shells, and they mostly grow on long-living trees, though we lump some other things together with nuts that also grow in the ground. All right, we've talked all about plants. Now we're gonna move really, really quickly through the three types of foods that we get from animals, milk, eggs, and meat. Milk, of course, is the food that we begin our lives with. Not just humans, but all mammals. That name means a creature of the breast. The first food that every mammal tastes is milk. And we're not limited to drinking just one kind of milk. We can drink most other animal milks, though some humans can actually do that better than others. And we're going to come back to questions of lactose and lactase a little bit later. When humans took up dairying for the first time, they used cows, goats, and ewes as surrogate milk makers. They found that mammals were basically moving factories. They could take meadow and straw and turn it into human nourishment. You can take many mammal milks and drink them by themselves, but you can also take raw milk and turn it into different things. If you harness the assistance of microbes, it's not hard to turn milk into cream, butter, cheese, and other foods, which have the advantage of being either easier to digest or easier to store. Milk is one of the key things that distinguishes mammals from fish or reptiles. We think that milk probably began to exist around 300 million years ago as a protective skin secretion for hatchlings that were being incubated on its mother's skin. And that's still true for the platypus, one of our weirdest mammals. But once milk evolved, it gave newborn animals the advantage of a good food even after being born, and the opportunity to continue physical development outside of the womb. This quality is essential for humans. Think about a newborn. For months after birth, we're helpless animals, and we use that time to grow brains that would either be too large to keep in the womb or to pass through a birth canal. So it's milk that helped us evolve large brains and turned us into these smart, unusual animals that we are today. Then, of course, there's eggs. There's a reasonable chance that you might have had an egg today for breakfast. An egg is a compact and self-contained bag of nutrients. It also has the mechanisms and instructions inside it to transform itself into a living, breathing creature. Around the world, all sorts of creation stories start with an egg, from the Egyptian Book of the Dead to the Greek Orphic Mysteries. There's always that magical notion of life springing forth from a shell, which holds true if you've ever seen something hatch. The earliest eggs on planet Earth were aquatic ones. They were released by fish and other creatures. But sometime, probably around 300 million years ago, reptiles developed a self-contained egg. That egg was covered in thick, leathery skin and had enough food inside it to let an embryo grow. Then, 100 million years later, birds evolved, and they produced a refined version of that early reptile egg. A modern egg is an incredible package. It has a hard, mineralized shell that lets an embryo grow in even really dry or inhospitable conditions, shielded completely from microbes. These are the same qualities that make an egg a pretty ideal food for humans. You've got a balanced package of nutrition and tough packaging, and it means that you can keep it for weeks without any real attention or care. American eggs have some of their outer membrane removed in an industrial process, but European eggs or eggs in most of the world you can keep more or less indefinitely. 
You can eat an egg by itself. You can boil it, fry it, bake it, roast it, pickle it, ferment it, lots of different things. But you can also use an egg to generate a broad range of structures through processes, again, of protein denaturing. You can make light airy meringues or dense custards. You can use an egg to emulsify or combine oil and water in sauces. Eggs are used to refine candies and ice cream or to give substance to soups, bread, pastas, and cake. You can use eggs to clarify wine or to remove components from stock. We use a lot of different animal eggs, everything from pigeons and turkeys to wild birds, penguins, turtles, crocodiles. But humans far and away tend to prefer chicken eggs in modern times, followed in distant second place by the duck egg. Finally, let's talk briefly about meat. Later on, we're going to think through the idea of eating animals a lot more closely. But for now, let's just generalize, and we'll say that of all the foods we obtain from animals and plants, meat has always been the most highly prized. Meat is relatively new in the diet of primates. Our primate ancestors lived exclusively on plant foods. We were vegetarians at first. But around two million years ago, as the African climate changed and there was diminishing vegetation, humans began to scavenge animal carcasses. That was probably the beginning of our relationship with meat. And we're gonna talk about this process a lot next time. There are a lot of positive things you can say about meat. Animal flesh and bone marrow with stores of fat inside are much more concentrated sources of food energy and tissue building protein than nearly any plant food. It's likely that getting access to these foods helped turn hominids into modern humans. Eating meat helped us migrate out of Africa and to populate the entire world. Being able to eat other animals meant that we could move into colder regions in Europe and Asia, where plant food wasn't available or was rarely available in the winter. And then around 100,000 years ago, relatively recently, humans moved from being scavengers to being active hunters. That's when we start to see cave paintings of humans hunting wild cattle and horses. And it's fairly clear to us that these early humans saw their prey as embodiments of strength and vitality. But even though meat is highly prized culturally, a bit paradoxically, it's also the most widely avoided of the foods that we can eat. Eating meat means causing death and pain, fear to other creatures. If you cut into a piece of meat, you see flesh that looks like your own flesh. And that can be disconcerting. It's the reason that lots of people become vegetarians or vegans or pescatarians or avoid red meat or avoid meat at certain times. Lots of human beings starting in early history have found the suffering and death of animals to be an unacceptable price to pay for human pleasure, and that continues to the present day. There's a lot for us to work out here. Meat seems to have been essential for us to grow and evolve into the modern humans that we are today. But many ethicists would tell us that it's eating meat that also prevents us from becoming fully humane. We're gonna come back to those questions later on. We should just acknowledge that for now, Whatever we may feel and decide to do about meat, humans are omnivorous animals, and meat's an important food for nearly all food traditions and culturally valuable for the majority of human beings. Now, just a few words to clarify what I actually mean by meat. When we say meat, we refer to any body tissue from animals that we can eat as food. And there's a wide range of these things, anything from frog legs to calf brains. But we generally tend to make a distinction between meats proper, that's muscle tissue whose job is to move parts of the animal, and organ meats, things like liver, kidney, intestines, tongue, brain. Go back to the biological role of proteins and fats that we just talked about. Most of our meats are muscles. They're the machinery that helps propel an animal across a meadow or through a forest, or helps it move through the sea or across the sky. When animal muscles get a signal from the nervous system, they contract or shorten themselves. That's what you do if you flex a muscle. And muscles are packed with filaments that do that job. That's why meat is such a rich source of protein. But meat also has other things that make it valuable as a food source. All animals require energy in order to live, and as animals, they store that energy as fat. Almost all animals lay down large stores of fat that they can use as energy, and we do the exact same thing. And in different ways, humans consume this fat as part of meat. We enjoy animals that have been naturally fattened, like game animals, which you tend to hunt in the fall. But we also enjoy eating animals that have been artificially fattened, whether that's in the form of overfeeding before slaughter, or in the form of things like geese, whose livers have been fattened through force feeding. I have a 
strange relationship with animal proteins because uh, I don't actually want to cook them anymore. I'm far more attracted to cooking vegetables, grains, and fish, um, but somehow I'm working with a lot of meat all the time, and I haven't quite figured that out yet. And we cannot disrespect an animal. Um, so we bring a lot of whole animals in here from people that are treating those animals properly and then the trash can gets put away and I'm a hippie you know what I mean I like fucking herbs and when there's a whole animal in here it's a I put the right music on and I break the whole thing down and everything has a use um, all the way to the point where I could take the head of a lamb and um, drop it in koji rice and salt um, and make a lamb gorum which would be like a lamb flavored soy sauce and nothing 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 gets wasted if we have too much duck fat or we have too much pork fat or bacon fat, we just make soap. We either sell it or we give it away because we're just not wasting it. There's so much more that we could talk about. And we're going to come back to a lot of these themes before long. But let's just call this a broad overview of the kinds of things that humans eat. From basic chemicals to entire animals. What we have here broadly are a set of chemicals, substances, and living organisms that we're involved in relationships with. Okay, a lot of those relationships are kind of one-sided. We use materials, ingest them, and use them up. But many of these plants and animals are also using us, in some sense, to reproduce themselves and to further their own reproductive advantage. This is certainly true and easy to see in the form of plants, which have grown sweeter so that they attract us and then they trick us into making more plants. It's a little harder when we talk about the animals that we farm or herd and put into more industrial settings but we still have a dialectical relationship with animals that are predicated around basic biological needs and desires. But I'm going to leave it here for now. Next time we're going to dive right into the debates over how we began to domesticate plants and animals. It was then that we began to accumulate surpluses of food, and that, I'm going to show you, is the beginning of civilization itself. We're going to pick it up next time. Thanks for joining me. See you soon. Try everything once, first of all. As long as it's in abundance, it's just food. It's not that serious, as long as no one's starving. I think something that's hard for folks is to say that the Instagram chef with three Michelin stars with a million followers who's got the tweezers and a staff of 30 people and everything is so perfect is absolutely no different from the street cook in Hong Kong that makes one pancake and throws it to you for a dollar for 30 years. And there's no difference between those two people. It's just people expressing themselves creatively or as a craftsman in how they want or can. Yeah.